that video twice now and I've cried both times. Whew. So glad you're here. Hey, could you join me in giving a hand to all of our guests that are here today? Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, I've met people from all over the state that are joining us, friends and family from out of town and people uh, new here today. Thank you so much. I'd love the opportunity to meet you if I haven't had the chance to already, but God bless you. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we welcome you here on this Father's Day. I want to acknowledge that I know Father's Day is um, is one of those days that it's kind of mixed emotions for a lot of us. Some of us are uh, our fathers have already went on to be with the Lord, our grandfathers. Um, for some of us, we have wonderful memories. Um, for others, maybe you didn't know your dad, or maybe uh, you don't have good memories. Um, I pray today uh, that the Holy Spirit would just come and bring peace and comfort and joy. And we acknowledge um, the experience that you've had and know this, that, that above everything, that we serve, um, we, we serve the greatest Father. We serve a good, good Father that loves us so much and has a plan and purpose for our life. And so uh, while we celebrate our earthly fathers, we also celebrate our heavenly Father uh, today. So can we give a, one more time all of, a hand to all of the dads that are here today? And, and I give honor to my dad and my grandfather, our grandfathers that went on to be with the Lord. So glad that you're here today. If you have your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter one. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter four in verse one. As you do that, I wanna make mention of a few things. Our small groups are, have just kicked off and it's not too late to jump in in a small group and get connected here. We're a church not just with small groups, but of small groups. So that means we the best part of what happens in City Hills is not what happens here on Sundays, but it's in, in homes and coffee shops and uh, in smaller gatherings where you can get connected with each other and walk together. So we would love for you to jump in a small group. There's over 50 to choose from just this summer semester alone. And, um, and maybe God's calling you to lead. We're praying and believing for over 100 small groups this coming fall because we are called to build community and walk together with one another. So jump in a small group and get connected. Also, you saw it earlier. We have our summer blockbuster coming up in your seats. There should be some invitations. Uh, this is this is something that's so much fun. Uh, we This is a, a special Sunday. This, it's the best opportunity all year long to bring somebody with you to church. Uh, I promise the message is going to be powerful, and it's going to be a mixture of uh, movie and message and the gospel all together, and we're going to have popcorn and food and fun. It just so that's going to be on Sunday, July the 4th. So go ahead and make plans to invite somebody to come with you. It's going to be a great time. And then also our serve day. We're joining together on July the 10th with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of churches all across the nation and the world to get outside of our four walls and make a difference. And so if you've never been involved in a serve day here at City Hills, no worries. Uh, just jump in. We'd love to have you connected. There's 35 right now, over 35 individual projects that'll be taking place simultaneously out in the city to love and serve and make a difference in the name of Jesus. So uh, jump in, get connected. We'd love to have you serve uh, with us on Serve Day. Mark that down. It's going to be a great time. There's nothing like Serve Day. It's so, so awesome. Um, Revelation chapter four and verse one. I'm excited to, to preach the word today. I, I just, I wrestled with this word and I really feel like it's for, for somebody here today on this Father's Day. Um, and the scripture says this, then I looked and I saw a door standing open in heaven and the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here. I want, to, I want to stop right there. I want to call this message today, the door is open. The door is open. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray you'd speak more words than I could ever say, Lord, in a message. Holy Spirit, would you come? I recognize you can do so much more. So God, thank you for what you've already done in this service um, already, God. And thank you for what you're going to do. Our hearts are open. Speak to us today, Holy Spirit, have your way. Um, make us better, make us new today. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. It's Father's Day, and I was thinking about all the things that I say to my kids that, I, that it annoyed me when my parents said it to me. It's part of the joy of being a dad. You get to annoy your kids. And uh, things like this, they say, you know, on a trip, are we there yet? Anybody used to bug your parents by saying that, and now it's God's way of getting back at us. Now our kids say that to us. Are we there yet, Dad? And uh, then we have three young boys, uh, nine, ages nine, six, and three. 
and uh, they'll fight in the car on the way on vacation. And I'll never forget a few years ago, they were fighting in the car and I got upset. And I said, I will turn the, I, I pulled over in the intersection. I said, I will turn this car around. And I had a flashback from whenever I was a kid. And my wife looked over at me really, really quietly after I was back. And she said, no, you won't. We're going on this vacation. <laughs> Been looking forward to this vacation. <laughs> One of the things I find myself saying all the time that I remember being said to me is shut the door. My kids will walk out of a house with all the doors open. I cannot wait someday at the Lord Terry's when they have kids and I'll just go to their house, open the fridge, open the front door, open the back door, just leave. <laughs> That's my plan. But I just could not get over this passage of Scripture in Revelation chapter 4 when John has a vision of heaven. He has a vision of, of what heaven is going to be like. And you kind of get to peel back. If you could peel back time and you could look into eternity, we're getting a picture of that. And I, I just love how John describes it. He says, I saw a door. And it was not a closed door. It was an open door. There was a door left open to heaven. I want to start this morning by saying I'm so thankful we serve a God that left the door open to heaven. I'm so thankful we don't serve a closed heaven. We don't serve a God who has a closed door to heaven, but it's for whosoever will, they can come. That it doesn't matter your past or your background or what you've been through, that the door is still open to heaven. It's not, you don't require a secret password. It's just come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden. And God says, I will give you rest, the door was open. See, I don't like the door being open in my house because I say things like this to my kids. What, you would think we can air condition the whole neighborhood? God's not so concerned about that. He's been air conditioning the world <laughs> since the beginning. Say, shut the door. Some, something's gonna get in that we don't want. Some critter's gonna get in that we don't want in the house. Shut the door, shut the door. I, I, I'm so thankful that God's not interested in shutting doors so that broken people cannot get in his house, but he leaves the door wide open today that the door is open. I came to tell some, a simple message today. The door is open. He said, I saw a vision and it was a door open in heaven. And then I heard a voice like a trumpet and the voice was an invitation. It says, come up here. God was inviting him to come up higher. See, John was about to get the revelation of the end of the age. See, the book of Revelation is not just a revelation of the end times. It's a revelation. Uh, revelation chapter one says of Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of who Jesus is. And that's what happens in Revelation one. Jesus uh, reveals himself to John. John is on the Isle of Patmos. He has been sent there for preaching the gospel. The Isle of Patmos was essentially a prison island and uh, history would tell us that he was boiled in hot oil and he was sentenced to life on this prison island of Patmos without hope of, of ever being free again. And in this moment, God comes to him with a vision. He gets a vision of Jesus. And then Revelation chapter two and three gets this vision of the churches and God speaks to the churches. And then before he gets to the part of the book of Revelation that, all of it, that, is, that he's famous for, all the things of the end of time, we get Revelation chapter four. And it's this door that's been left open in heaven. A door and a voice and the voice calling him higher. My prayer today is that you would hear the voice, not my voice, but you would hear the voice of the Holy Spirit calling you higher through the open door. What was he being called to? First of all, if you're taking notes, he was being called a higher than his past experiences. See, if there's anybody who could have lived in the past, it was John. He was one of Jesus's inner circle. He saw Jesus transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. He, he rested on the bosom of Jesus at the Last Supper. He was so close. He was the one that Jesus loved. But here he is at a moment where God is saying to him, I know you've experienced a lot of great things in my presence, but I wanna tell you, there's more than what you've experienced in your past. There's more, John, you don't have to live in your past for one more day. I came to tell somebody today, maybe, maybe you've had some incredible experiences with God. Maybe you've been living for God for a long time. Can I encourage you this morning? There's more for you, that God's not finished with you. There's still a door that's been left open in heaven. 
And maybe you think that the best days of your life are behind you. Or maybe you think that, I was thinking, praying, to, maybe there's somebody here today, you think the best days of your marriage is behind you, and it's like the glory days are back there somewhere. Can I tell you, God's word says we go from faith to faith and from glory to glory. And God comes to John and says, I want you to come up a little bit higher because I left a door open for you. I got a plan and purpose for your life, and I want to do something greater than what you've ever experienced in your past. Maybe you're living in the past in the negative. I love this quote. A man is not old until his regrets take the place of his dreams. We're not old until we live a life full of regrets instead of living a dreamer's life. And God invites John to get past his past. There's a reason why the rear view mirror is much smaller than the windshield in our car. Because the past is great to glance at, but you'll have a wreck if you live in it. And some of us have come here today, we're living in the past. We're living in the past, maybe in some glory days of yesterday, and you have given up on hope of the future. Or maybe you're living in the past, and the devil keeps bringing up your worst mistake and saying, that's who you are. Can I just say to somebody this morning, you may have done what the devil says you did, but you're not who the devil says you are. You're a child of the Most High God, and you don't have to be stuck in your past one more day. God says, there's a door open, John. I want you to come up beyond your past. Secondly, he says, I want you to come up Beyond your present circumstances, John was surrounded by a sea. He was surrounded in a prison. He said, I want you to come up beyond the circumstances that you're in. And I think sometimes the problems that we face in our lives have a way of keeping us from entering into the presence of God and the, all that God has for us because we're so focused on what we're doing right here, right now. But God invites us higher. In Revelation chapter 21, after God gives him a vision, after he walks through this open door, he gets this revelation. See, he was surrounded by the sea. It was like the sea was his prison bars, the prison walls. And here's what he says in verse one. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And watch his detail about what heaven is gonna be like. And he said, I didn't notice any sea there. In other words, when I got into the presence of God and I got a revelation of heaven, I understood that the things on earth that currently have me bound, I'm not bound by them there because God is in full control of my life and he's calling me above my current circumstance. Here's the third thing that God invited him. God invites John higher than his future concerns. God was about to show John a lot of things. The tribulation period, the antichrist, the mark of the beast, the false prophet, things that when he saw them, he would be confused and concerned. And it's as if God was saying this, John, there are a lot of things that are about to happen in your future that you don't understand. So I'm going to give you the very best that I have right now to get you ready for what I want to do in your future. See, The circumstances that surround our future and the uncertainty, maybe you're here, you're a college age student, you're a young adult, you're uncertain about your future, you don't know what's gonna happen next. Maybe you're dealing with a health concern and something's happening in your body, something's happening around you, maybe it's something happening in your mind or your emotions or something happening where the future concerns that you don't understand have a way of stealing and robbing from you the joy of God's presence and the joy of encountering. Maybe, you want, maybe you've wanted to experience God today in this service, but you're so just, you, you cannot get off your mind that circumstance that just seems to plague because you don't know what's going on. You don't know what's gonna happen. And this had to be where John was. He was in a difficult situation and he was about to see some things that was gonna make him scratch his head. And I'll say, people to this day are trying to figure out everything that John was seeing there. But he was saying, I'm going to invite you to a place that will get you higher than your past experiences, higher than your current problems, and even higher than your future concerns that you don't understand and you can't figure it all out, I'm going to invite you to a place that will change everything. And so what was the door? What was was this door going to lead to? What was this place that was so important to visit before you visited all the uncertainty of the future? What was this thing that God was wanting to do in John's life. Well, let's read it together. Verse two, after he walks through the door, it says, instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones like Jasper and Carnelian and the glow of an emerald circled 
his throne like a rainbow. Verse 10, the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the one on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they laid their crowns down before the throne and said, you are worthy, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. God drops John right in the middle of a worship service. The door that was bringing him beyond his past, beyond his present, beyond his future concerns, the door was leading to a worship service where the throne of God was, and there were angels and elders around the throne casting their crowns down at the foot of the throne, and we get a picture of worship. It's as if God was saying simply this, True worship can take you above the circumstances that you're currently facing, John, straight to the throne room of God. And I want to encourage somebody with this today. The door is still open. The door to God's presence, the door to God's power, the door to God's throne room was left open. Just waiting for us. That's why we do what we do here at City Hills. That's why we worship God with an abandon. Why? Because it's in God's presence where things change. It's not that we're here to go through some kind of religious ritual, or go through the motions or three points in a poem or a couple songs and just get out of this place. If that's all you came and experienced here today, that, that can't change your life. But one moment in the presence of God, one moment if you'll go through the door, one moment, if you'll go through his open door to all that he has for you, everything can change and you can have a whole new perspective. So I just want to talk a little bit on this Father's Day about worship. And I was thinking, Lord, why did you give me this message about worship on Father's Day? And I wrestled it and wrestled it until right before first service, God brought to my mind John chapter four, where it says the father seeketh such to worship him. In other words, on Father's Day, God's looking for people to worship the father. God's looking for people that will be willing to get out of your circumstance that you're facing and get into the presence and power of God. So why do we worship how we do? I want to share with you three reasons why we worship the way that we do. First of all, number one, worship is our purpose. First Peter chapter two, verse nine says, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Somebody say, that means me. That means me. A holy nation. I forgot to ask you earlier, how many leaders do we have in the house? I told you I was going to ask you. Yeah, hands up all over the house. Yeah, that's me. That's me. That's me. God's special possession that you may declare. You guys are awesome. That you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. God says, here's the reason why I've called you out of darkness so that you can worship me. God says, I brought you out of darkness so that you can praise me. In other words, Part of what we're doing here at church, it has nothing to do with us. This is not about us. This is about entertaining the presence and power of God and worshiping him because that's why he set us free. Church is not just about us getting, you know, getting, well, that song was good or that message was good or we make it all about us and God is saying, well, would you for just one moment make it about me because I created you to worship me. We are created to worship God with all of our heart, with all of our soul and God's looking for worshipers. God's here today looking for people that are willing to say, you know what? I didn't just come to church for me but I came to church today to worship my God who gave breath in my lungs and blessed me with my family and blessed me with all the things that he's put in my life. I came here to worship the Lord. God asked for worship. We were created to worship him. So, so how did God ask for worship? Psalm chapter 150 says this. I love this. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and with the dancing. Praise him with the strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. And if that's not enough, praise him with the resounding cymbals as well. And then he wraps it all up by saying, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God said, I'm looking for people that want to praise me. 
I'm not looking for people to just come to church and go through the motions. I'm looking for people that are willing to walk through an open door of worship and everything changes on the other side of the open door because they're going to see God on the throne and him fully in, con in control and in charge. That word in this passage that you see on the screen about praise and praise the Lord, praise that word. Every time that word praise is written there, it's one of seven Hebrew words for the word praise. See, maybe uh, some think, well, you know what? I'm not really an extrovert. I'm not really all about praise. Well, you see it there. It's, well, here's what the word praise means. It's where we get the word hallelujah. It's the word hallel. Here's what it means, to shine, hence to make a show, to boast, and thus to be clamorously foolish, to rave, and to celebrate. This is what God invites us to do. God invites us to go all in in our worship with him, to go through the open door and to experience more of his presence and power and not just to go through the motions on Sunday. Psalm chapter 30, verse four. Here's some expressions of worship in the scripture. It says, sing to the Lord, all ye godly ones. The scripture goes on to say, come everyone, clap your hands, shout to God with joyful praise. Psalm 149, verse three, praise his name with dancing. Psalm 134, verse two, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Acts chapter four, verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in praise to God. I wanna ask you today, is your worship determined by what's convenient to you or what's commanded by God? Are we worshiping God's way? My challenge to you is simply this, go from being a spectator to a participator today. Go from being a spectator. See, one of the things you'll notice about heaven in John's vision is there was nobody spectating. There was nobody just sitting by and being like, oh, I don't really like that song very much. I wish they would sing that other one, you know. There wasn't anybody doing that. There was everybody participating and going all out and worshiping God. And I just want to acknowledge this, that right now while we're in this room, there are angels and elders and there's miraculous things taking place in the heavenlies. And our God is sitting on a throne and he is fully in charge, fully in charge and he is being worshiped. And church, I just believe that we are invited to that place to join him, to be that church that worships God we're called to not just worship God. That's the other thing I noticed. They're not just worshiping God for what he's done. They're worshiping God for who he is. See, there's a difference between praising God and worshiping God. Praising God many times is just, God, thank you for this day. Thank you for my family. Thank you for providing for me. All those things are wonderful and we need to do it. But worship says, God, even when I don't understand everything, I worship you for who you are, not just what you do for me. God, I'm not just here so that you would do everything that I want you to do. I worship you even in the middle of the trial. See, I'm challenging somebody today to come through an open door, but you don't come through an open door by focusing on the pain of the present or the, or, or the experience of the past or the worries of the future. You gotta step through the door of worship. And that means you worship God even when you don't understand. Let me show you an example of this in Job chapter one. Job goes through difficulty after difficulty and his whole family uh, dies in a day. And watch what Job does. Job gets up, he tore his robe, he shaved his head, he fell on the ground and he... See, you can worship God when everything around you is not going right. I'm preaching to somebody today. You can, you can praise God when, the, when everything's going good, but there's something powerful that says, God, I'm not just here to praise you, but God, even whenever things are happening that I don't understand, you're still on that throne and you're still in control. And when everything's not going my way, he got down and he worshiped God. He said this, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked I'm gonna return. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away, but blessed be the name of the Lord. He said, I realize I'm a worshiper. I worship God in every season. I worship God when I feel like it. I worship God when I don't feel like it. That's from the front to the back in this, in this gathering. My prayer is that every time we come together, we're not just gonna worship based on feeling, but we come in here to give a sacrifice of praise because God made us to worship him and God created us to worship him and he saved me and he changed my life. He saved my life 18 years ago and God helped me if I can't get in this place and say, God, you saved me from a miry pit. I don't deserve to be in this place today. I don't deserve to have the blessings you have in my life today. You are good. You are holy. You are righteous. You are my God. See, when we get into that, we get into worship and we start entering the door. 
of God's presence and power. That's what changes us. The door is open. Worship is our purpose. Secondly, the reason we worship is because worship is how we fight our battles. I love that song we sing around here. This is how I fight my battles. And it's so much more than a song because so many of us, we're trying to fight, uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to fight spiritual battles with natural weapons. But worship is a spiritual weapon that can destroy any stronghold that the enemy would bring in your life. You see, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the army had surrounded King Jehoshaphat and he began to pray. He said, God, we're outnumbered and I don't know what to do. And the spirit of God moved upon a young prophet named Jehaziel. And Jehaziel says this, King, understand this. The battle is not yours. It's the Lord's battle. I want to tell somebody today, the battle that you're in, it's not your battle. So stop fighting it with natural weapons. It's the Lord's battle. So you just worship the Lord in the middle of it all. And God's going to do the miracle in your life. The Bible says, oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. In other words, let God's worship get bigger in my heart and bigger in my mind. I want to magnify God and worship him with all of my heart. And so after the word came to him, the scripture says this, he appointed second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 21, the king appointed singers to walk ahead of the army singing to the Lord and praising him for his holy splendor. This is what they say. Give thanks to the Lord for his faithful love endures forever. So they start, what a battle plan this was. What a battle plan. What are you going to do? Hey, let's put the guys in front that will just worship God. Let's put all the band up front. I'm sure they appreciated that, but they had a word that was far beyond. What a, what a walk of faith. What a walk of trust to say, you know what? We're going to put worship first because God says it's his battle. And they started worshiping God. You talk about a worship that comes out when the enemy's coming against you and it looks like there's no hope. They didn't have anything but to do but to trust God. And I'm preaching to somebody today. You may not have anything to do. The enemy's put, you, put your back against the wall, but you have something that the enemy can't destroy and that's a worship of your God. And as they begin to worship, the Bible says, as they begin to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies of Amnon, Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir to start fighting amongst themselves. See, see, the enemy's goal is to get us fighting amongst ourselves. But God's goal is to, as we worship in unity together, it causes the enemy to fight amongst himself. And we start having victory in our lives. This is how we fight our battles. God does miracles. See, God's hand's so much bigger than my hand. One of the first uh, pastors that ever invited me to preach whenever I was 18 years old was a man um, named Brother Clement. He pastored in in a small town called Henderson, Kentucky. And um, he had heard that I was called to preach and knew some of my family and invited me to preach in his church. And I'll never forget, he was such a kind man. Trusting me to preach, no telling what in the world I was saying. The whole preaching Genesis to Revelation, about five minutes. I was just giving it all I got, but he told me a story I'll never forget. He told me, he said, he said, Brandon, whenever I was a young preacher, he said, I was on the stage playing music and I was watching a different prayer team, my pastor and some different leaders in the church pray for people at the end of the service. And he said, God gave me a vision while these people were being prayed for. He says, as those people would lay their hands on the people that needed prayer. He said, I had a vision of a larger hand. Another hand came down through the ceiling of that little church. And that as that hand of that saint of God would go on the hand of the person in need, this mighty hand of God would come down on top of that hand and miracles would start taking place. And I've never forgot that vision, church, because God's hand is so much bigger than my hand. And when we worship God, the hand of God comes in our situation. That's why at the end of every gathering, we always have time for prayer. That's why we always have time for people to come down to the altar. Why? Because there's a hand from another world that is wanting to reach down. And if we'll walk through the door, if we'll be humble enough to say, God, I can't do this without you and I'll walk with you, then a hand from another world will do what we could never do. This is my story time and time again in my life. 
when, when worship just became a weapon, when worship became the difference maker. See, this is one of the greatest things that you could ever learn as a child of God, that when you don't know what to do, you can worship God. And when things don't make sense, you can worship God. And as you worship God, your problems that seem so big, God starts getting bigger and your problems starts getting smaller. See, as you worry, your problems start getting big and your God starts getting small. But as you worship God, all of the problems that seem like they're on top of your world, they start getting small as you start worshiping your God. We have a, our youngest boy is named Baylor and we had a lot of complications with him before he was born a few weeks out from when he was born, uh, he stopped moving and we went to the doctor and they, I'll never forget that ultrasound experience with the ultrasound tech there. And usually all of our other times we've, we've had that uh, ultrasound done. You know, it's a joyous time we're, we're, we're looking at the baby and we're celebrating and listen to the heartbeat. But this time it was different. I could tell the tone of of the, the, the ultrasound tech, I could tell that she was uh, nervous. I could tell she didn't really wanna talk to us much. And it got so awkward in the room, my wife just started crying and um, didn't really tell us anything there and took us back up to the room uh, where, where we were at Fort Sanders here downtown. And, and uh, I, I'll never forget, not long after that, the doctor came, in, he came into our room and he said, have they told you what's wrong yet? Have they told you? And that's not what we wanted to hear. And, they, and the doctor said, well, we don't really know what's going on. And he, he, he started going into all the things that could be wrong and all the things that they didn't understand and all the tests they were gonna do. And it just felt like I was having an out-of-body experience. Like, I can't believe I'm getting this news. I can't believe I don't understand. And when the doctor left, we were emotional. And I just remember, I didn't have the words to say. I didn't know what to do, but I just remember grabbing the hand of my wife there while she was laying in that bed at Fort Sanders. And we just began to worship God. We just began to say, God, I thank you that you're in control of this situation. God, we thank you. We started entering that open door. See, in Fort Sanders, there was an open door to heaven. And it just took two people to hold hands with one another and say, we're here to worship you, God, because we know you're on the throne even when we're going through this thing that we don't understand. The door is open. The door is open. The door is open. You don't have to just wait to come to church to experience his presence. The door is open. Every day of your life, every time you get overwhelmed, I want to tell you the door is open. The door is open. The door is, if you don't remember anything else I say today, the door is open. The door is open. Are you dealing with things from your past? The door is open. Are you dealing with problems in your present? The door is open. Are you uncertain about the future? Come up a little higher. The door is still open. Worship is how we fight our battles. And thirdly, worship is how we leave a legacy. Worship is how we leave a legacy. Matthew chapter 26, Jesus was at the home of Simon the, the leper. The scripture says, and um, I think it should say the Simon the used to be leper because he was no longer a leper. He had been healed um, by this. He had been healed of this seemingly uncurable disease by Jesus. And he's sitting there with Jesus. And verse seven says, a woman came to him while they were surrounded by these people who had had an encounter with Jesus. A woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured out on his head as they were reclining at the table. But watch this verse eight. When the, the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste? They asked. In verse 13, truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. She, because of her act of worship, extravagant worship, because she went through the door, she didn't just stay in the crowd. She didn't just stay just going through the motions because she felt that draw and that call of heaven to go higher. God says, everywhere the gospel's preached, this woman's gonna have a legacy because of her worship. Worship is how we leave a legacy. The thing that I was drawn to in this passage here on this Father's Day was how much I can be like these men. Notice, the men missed it. The dads missed it. What were they thinking about? Of course, well, we all, the budget. If you read on there like, hey, you could, they could have spent this, you know, we need to spend this on other things, Jesus. We got, we got stuff to do. <laughs> and isn't that like so many of us? Guys, let me talk to the men, those of us in the house. We can miss the door 
because of all the details and all the things. And here's a lady who leaves a legacy. I say on this Father's Day, God's looking for men who won't miss it. God's looking for men who are willing to leave a legacy. That's what our world needs. I find it interesting that when Paul is writing to Timothy to tell the church that he pastored how they were supposed to live, he talked to the women and how they were supposed to live and what they were supposed to do. And the men, he talked to them, gave them a unique instruction to the men. He talks to the women about modesty and um, different things. And then he talks to the men this, 1 Timothy 2, 8, I desire therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, wrath and doubting. It's as if God is saying, this is something that's gonna be hard for men. This worship thing. The thing that I need to tell men, that's all he said to the men. Here's what I pray that men would do lift up their hands and worship God. They have the greatest legacy that we can leave our sons and daughters is the legacy that we are worshipers. I just, in my heart, I just saw a army of men, hands lifted, not perfect, no wrath. That's us, wrath and doubting. That's us guys, wrath and doubting. We're always doubting something. We're trying to figure out the boat. We're trying to get all these ducks in a row and we're, we're getting angry, we're wrath. No, God says, if you just lift up your hands and worship me, all that stuff goes away. And I can start using you to leave a legacy. The reason I couldn't get away from this message, I'll share this with you, is because this is not my message. This is a message from my grandfather couldn't get it off my heart, off my mind. My grandfather went to be with the Lord a few years ago. He made an impact on my life. I'm so thankful. I give honor to my dad, a wonderful dad. Um, I have a grandfather still um, alive. I give honor to him. And then I have a grandfather passed away. And my wife um, had two wonderful grandfathers that are in heaven with Jesus that impacted my life as well. But my, um, my, my papa, he was a man that left a legacy of worship. And uh, I preach about him often, but he made that kind of an impact on my life by the way that he lived. And he would get these visions or God would kind of speak to him and he would write it down in their living room. There'd just be notebooks full of things written down. And, and uh, my grandmother was visiting me a few weeks ago and she handed me this folder and she had she had put in this folder a paper that my grandfather, that she had typed out from my grandfather's notes of something the Lord gave him in 1996, December 13, 1996. He writes this, it's not a vision, but something I felt God give me in my spirit, given to God, to Brother Charles Ricker. That's my grandfather. And my grandmother said, she said, whenever I was praying the other day, she said, I felt the Lord remind me of this that he gave, and I, he, she said this, I felt like this is for City Hills. What God spoke to him in 1996, I wanna read it to you, I wanna, it says this, I woke at 2.15 a.m., got up, put some wood on the fire and went back to bed. As I lay there trying to go to sleep, it seemed as if sleep was far from me. Then I began meditating on the Lord and his work and it seemed, I seemed to see a work that was to be done in a while. There was a multitude of hurting, sick, afflicted, confused, hungry, tired of the rat race, tired of the pretense, hypocrisy world that they live in. And they were needing some true help for all their needs. I believe there's coming a time when the church will be a church of the unlocked doors, a place where people will be praying, teaching, counseling, comforting, loving, and preaching to or for someone 24 hours a day because the Lord has ordained it to be. I believe that there will be someone around the clock seeking the Lord. I look for sinners to come in and be saved, people without hope seemingly to enter and receive hope, sick and lame to get healing for their soul, mind, body, and spirit. Jesus is going to be the one lifted up. No man will have a thought of taking any glory for himself because it's going to be so awesome, the work the Lord will be doing. I believe it will be noised abroad that people will stream in here to get their needs met a place where those, there's no pretense, no put on, it's the real thing. 
I can see wheelchairs being pushed out, empty by the people that were wheeling them in. Blinded eyes being opened, lame people walking, running, shouting the victory. I see happiness on faces of people that before only had despair. I see hope where there was no hope. I'm like Elijah, I see an abundance of rain. The Lord is ready to move. I saw cars and vehicles of all kinds in droves to receive something from the Lord, the church of the unlocked doors. And that's what was on my mind. Since my grandmother gave that to me. And that's the legacy of a worshiper, that God would give things that would outlive that life and would encourage future generations that would see that we, you know why my grandfather had a vision of a church with unlocked doors? Because we serve a God who left the door of heaven open and everybody broken and everybody who needs hope and everybody who needs healing. So God help us to leave the doors unlocked so that everybody can be in and everybody can find hope and everybody can have freedom. So I say to you, Dad, I say to you, Grandfather, you mean more than what you even know. You're a leader. And God says, come through the open door today. Come up a little higher. I want to show you some things. Let's pray together all over the house. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you, God, that you have vision for us beyond our circumstances. Thank you, God, when we get in moments like John on that island, that prison island, where seemingly there was no hope. God, you had a reality that transcended that reality, Lord. Lord, I pray for dads and grandfathers and uncles and spiritual dads, and Lord, mentors and all of the men who've made such a difference and pastors and leaders and teachers and coaches. God, all of the men, God, I pray that they would rise up and come up higher, God, that they would let the Lord fight the battles, that they would trust you, God, that they would leave a legacy that the doors are open and there's hope in Jesus. I pray for every marriage today that has no hope. I pray for any person who's thought their best days are behind them. God, let them be resurrected to new life today. God, to know that the door to heaven is open and there's an invitation to come up higher, God. We choose to come into your presence today. Jesus name. Nobody looking around. The service will be incomplete without giving someone an opportunity just to come to Jesus. Not to be religious, not to join a church, but to come and give your life to the God who left the door open, wide open for you. I'd say to you today, don't walk out of these doors without walking through God's open door to give your life to Jesus. It just begins today with a simple prayer of surrender. I'd love to lead you in just a prayer of fresh start with God that's you today and you want to give your life to Jesus or recommit your life to Jesus, I invite you to pray with me. Let's pray together. Say, Jesus, I give my life to you today. I walk through your open door. Be my Lord. Be my God. Forgive me of any sin in my life. I choose today to trust you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I choose today to go wherever you want me to go from this day forward. I choose to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in this place today in Jesus' name. Can we give God a hand clap of praise all over the house as we stand to our feet? We're going to sing this song one more time, and as we do, we're going to have, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to have prayer team leaders down here that would love to pray with you. Maybe has something to do with this message, or maybe you just came bringing a burden in here and you need God to do a miracle in your life. We serve a God of miracles. The door is open to heaven. The door is open to the miraculous. If you need him, he's in this place today. We'd love to join with you and pray with you all over the house. And then the rest of us, why don't we just lift up our hands? We're not just singing this song today. We're doing battle today. We're doing battle against the enemy today. We're not just singing this song. We were made to worship our God. We're not just singing this song. We're leaving a legacy for future generations to serve the Lord. Come on, let's hands lifted all over the house. Let's worship our God before we go.